All right, good morning, Gospel Hope. It's good to see you here. I hope you're enjoying the change in the weather. A little bit crisper this morning, huh? Let's all stand together as rejoice, the Lord is King, is our theme. Let's sing. Rejoice. Rejoice, the Lord is King. Gospel Hope. We're thankful to see each of you here this morning and uh, grateful for a warm place to gather today. If you see somebody coming in looking around as if they need a seat and you have a spot near you, welcome them in. And that may even mean if you slide to the middle or end of a row, that will open up some space uh, and make it a little easier. I think we're going to be okay at the moment. But we're also known as a church that likes to show up anywhere from 10 to 15 to 20 <laughs> minutes you know, into a meeting or a program or a service like this, so keep your uh, eyes open. It's Name Tag Sunday. If you didn't get your name tag, you can do that right after the service, and this is a, a great way that we continue learning uh, who each is and building those relationships, and I've been encouraging you. I did it myself this morning in greeting somebody saying, please remind me again of your name because we didn't have a name tag thing at that point. Just be humble enough uh, to, to push through that fear that you sometimes have like, but I've asked them three weeks in a row. It's okay, That's, we keep working at it and uh, we, will, we will learn and um, build those relationships. I'm Danny, if you can't read that, uh, toward the back, one of the pastors here. It's a privilege to be uh, a part of Gospel Hope, a privilege to serve in this way. Uh, Matt will come in just a few minutes and share a few things with you. You may have noticed as we were singing that opening song, this great truth and the theme of the kingship of our God, and we're going to be emphasizing that all through the service today. So many things in our world at this moment that actually are out of control from the human perspective and from our vantage point, but there actually is a great king over all who in his wisdom and in his sovereignty actually permits and governs and uh, allows evil uh, to, to seemingly run its course, but never apart from his divine will. 
And this is the God who, going back to uh, the very beginning days of creation, is so powerful that he can take the greatest schemes and purposes of evil and turn them for his glory and even for our good. You know, there are a lot of people who woke up this morning who have no hope uh, of good coming to them today or ever. And there are many people who think that our existence is the product of random chance. Can you imagine the desperation of thinking you lived in a world that was governed by nothing more than a roll of the dice, as it were? Well, there's a different storyline that God is writing, and he's revealing that to us, and so we're going to sing about it. We're going to read in the scriptures together. We're going to pray our hearts in uh, and out of those truths through the morning, and our great prayer is that you would be blessed and strengthened, and if you don't know this living God, oh, this would be a great day for you uh, to place your faith and trust in him. I want to read a portion of Psalm 95, which tells us a little more about this great king, and then Dave Adam will come to lead us in prayer. Listen to these words. The first several verses uh, call us to praise this this God and king, and then in verse 3, there are specific reasons given. So note those, if you will, and take hold of them by faith. Psalm 95, O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For, here are the reasons. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Oh, come. Let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. And then this is astonishing, isn't it? For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Do you know how much he loves you? Oh, this is a great king, a great God, a good shepherd, and a dear friend. Let's pray together. Dave, you come and lead us, please. Let's pray. King of King, Lord of Lords, and the creator of all things, Lord, we come to you asking for your mercy, thanking you for your love to us, thanking you for sending your son to save us. Lord, as we have a world full of chaos, full of trouble, wars, and fightings, Lord, we're in the midst of that. Lord, give us peace. Give us patience and love for others. Help us, Lord, to be your light, even in this valley. Lord, you are greater than all trouble that we face. And we know, Lord, that we have an answer in you. We do ask, Lord, today that you accept our worship. Lord, hear our our prayers. Hear our singing. Lord, may the message be directed to us as one that leads us closer to you and help us, Lord, to serve and glorify and honor you and all we say and do. For we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand as we sing of the King that rescues us from darkness?
above us. He is separate in his all his goodness. Let's praise him. Holy, holy. great truth like that is supposed to remind us of our real place in the universe. Isn't it interesting that our culture is trying to tell us how great we are and that we can do it and, you know, just, you got it. And the reality is that God is big and we are small. And when we see him for who he is, it both causes us to praise him, doesn't it? But it also helps our hearts to rest. Mm -hmm. That we don't have to solve it all, figure it all out, make it all work. We, we are simply servants of the great king of the universe. And more than servants, sons and daughters adopted. What a privilege. And so hopefully as we sang this morning, it, it reminded us that God is big and we are small. If you're a guest with us this morning, I got to meet a few uh, new people this morning. And frankly, it might not be your first Sunday. It might be your second or third, but you were new to me. And uh, if you're a guest, we're thankful that you're here. Uh, in the chair in front of you, you'll see just a single card there. And one side says connect, and there's a little four blank thing you can fill out, or you can use the QR code to do it digitally, whatever you prefer. There are no more blanks in the digital than in the, you know, the card. Um, so it just uh, helps us to have a record of your vis visit, gives me a shot at remembering your name. And uh, we really, really appreciate it. We'll send you one follow-up email this week. And then from there, it's up to you uh, where you want to go or how you want to respond. And then on the other side is actually a QR code to get our bulletin, our out-the-door handout is what we call it, uh, delivered you know, digitally every week. And I checked this week, and there are 28 of you who get it. That's okay. That's not a lot. So uh, do it. That's there for you. I just want to say a big thank you for uh, all of you who came to help with the fence project over the last few weeks. Uh, whether you're working on the side project with Asa, we're almost there on his Eagle Scout project, so thanks. Or uh, on the South Side project with Jonathan, uh, I was amazed. I got a text about 12:30 in lunchtime yesterday, and it was like, "Here we are," and made huge progress. So thank you uh, for all of you who served in that way. It probably saved us about half the cost of the fence. Um, so it's probably a 25 to $30,000 fence, and we were able to do it for about half that. So thank you, thank you, thank you for your help. Uh, last announcement for me, and then Kristen's gonna come and tell us a little bit about a ladies' breakfast in a few weeks. Uh, the last announcement is this. After our service today, we're gonna try to end right around 11.15, and then we'll have a 10 or 15 minute break there. 
Uh, but at 11.30, from 11.30 to 12, uh, we want to have a quick church family meeting. Whether you're a regular attender or you're a member here, uh, we just want to give you some updates. I'll call it five five-minute updates. So if you do math, that means we got five minutes for people who go for more than five minutes. Um, but anyway, five five-minute updates from 11.30 to noon, we've got some new members who would like to join, uh, and then we have some updates on the building and finances and shepherding groups. We'll tell you about those, things like that, uh, but please stick around. That'll be really good. We will have a second nursery opportunity during that time, so we've got a second set of nursery workers to come in and help with nursery, and we have some uh, people for our kids' church kids. So if, you are four, if your kids are four years to second grade, there'll be uh, about 30 minutes of you know, coverage for them as well. If your children are older than second grade, if third grade, all the way up through teens, uh, you need to be in here for the meeting. So please don't create a game time or a hangout time out there. Come on in. You can survive for half an hour. It'll be just fine. Be good for you. So uh, that is the plan this morning. Uh, we do these about three times a year. We have one in the spring. We have one in the fall sometime. And then we have our major, you know, annual family meeting the first Sunday of December. It's kind of our rhythm as a church. Uh, so before we prepare our hearts to give, Kristen, would you come and just tell us a little about ladies' breakfast in a couple weeks? We are excited to have a ladies' brunch breakfast um, November 11th. It's been a while since we've all been together, and there are a lot of new ladies here. And so we just want to get to know everyone. Um, so please, please, please make it your best effort to come. We're gonna, there's a sign-up sheet underneath the TV and that table right underneath the TV back there just so that we all don't bring an egg dish so we can spread it around or, or bacon like the guys like to do. Yeah. Uh, like, I think somebody brings a slow cooker full of like bacon, which kind of look, would look kind of gross, but probably tastes okay. <laughs> All right, so there's a sign-up sheet. Everybody brings something, even if it's just like you went and got donuts from the grocery store, which I like, so that's all right. So sign up for that. Um, we're going to have a time of um, doing a little craft like ladies like to do. Some ladies don't like to do crafts. You do not have to do it if you don't like to do crafts. I'm going to do a pie demonstration, and then we're going to interview one of the ladies from our church so that we can just start to get to know people better. So that is the goal, and um, hopefully you can be there. It's from 9 to 10.30. We're not starting as early as the guys do because somebody just said, please don't start at 8 o'clock. And I said, okay, we'll start at 9. <laughs> All right, so please be there, November 11th, 9 to 10.30. If you forget to bring something, it's okay. We'll have plenty. But do your best to be here, and we're, we're looking forward to it. Thanks, Kristen. You can mark your calendars early, too. It's December, isn't it? The 9th, does that sound right? Uh, where there's a ladies' Christmas brunch. That's an annual tradition around here. So uh, come on November 11th, mark your calendar for December 9th, and um, jump in. We would love to have you come. As we prepare our hearts to give this morning, uh, Psalm 93 continues this idea of God as the king. It says this, The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed. He has put on strength as his belt. Yes, the world is established, it shall never be moved. Your throne is established from of old, you are from everlasting. The floods have lifted you up, O Lord, the floods have lifted up their voice, the floods lifted up their roaring. Mightier than the thunders of many waters, mightier than the waves of the sea, the Lord on high is mighty. Your decrees are very trustworthy, holiness befits your house, O Lord, forevermore. Let's pray together. God, as we turn our hearts now to this time of giving, it's only appropriate that we give to you the great King of Kings. Our gifts are not improving you in some way. They're not paying for something we've done. They're not gaining us favor, but they're a thankful offering, a sacrificial, joyful gift to you, our great God. Thank you for your goodness, your graciousness, your might, and your certainty. God, while all the world is changing around us and we are changing, you are the Lord, you do not change. And so we thank you for being the rock, the fortress that our souls so desperately need in the shifting sands of life. Please help us to give generously by faith with joy and sacrifice this morning to you who deserves all the praise. It's in Christ's name we pray, amen.
Unshaken by the schemes of man, he's never changing. Great I am, kingdoms rise and kingdoms fall. He is faithful through it all. Crown him king forever. Crown him king forever. Crown him king forevermore. Would you stand with me? great king humbled himself. Mighty God, immortal flesh, forsaken by a traitor's kiss, the curse of sin and centuries did pierce the lowly prince of They crucified the spotless man, buried by the sons of man, rescued by the Father's hand, to reign as King forever, reign as King forever, reign as King forevermore. King eternal God of grace, we crown you with the sure that your heart, like mine, is already encouraged just from the truth of those songs that we've been singing this morning. I will say when Matt announced that we're going to do our best to finish at 11.15, there were at least two members of the worship team who looked straight at me for some inexplicable reason. So I'm not sure what that is all about, but... No, we will. We, we should be fine this morning. I do want to thank you all, uh, first of all, just for caring for one another in general. I mean, there's, there's a lot of need represented in a congregation like this, and it's always a blessing to find out uh, as, we, as our, our, our pastor elder team tries to call people and meet with people to hear that there have been people in the door ahead of us or on the phone ahead of us just encouraging and caring for one another. In particular, I want to extend thanks on behalf of the Kaminskys right now. I know they're on a little brief sabbatical, so you don't see them here week in and week out, but Kelly has experienced some severe back pro uh, problems, which just complicates the discomfort of the pregnancy that she's going through, and, and really, she's been able to do very little. It was a step of progress that she was able to get up and just walk around a little bit this week. And Daniel messaged me yesterday, yesterday saying, the Gospel Hope family has been amazing. And some of you have taken food and some of you have dropped off gift cards. And I know a group of ladies went over a few nights ago just to help clean and, and care for them and do some things around the house. So thank you for what you're doing. That leads me to a second expression of gratitude. And on behalf of our pastors, uh, the cards and gifts and especially the handmade cards that show up in our box or uh, children who bring those up, just expressing your appreciation during Pastor's Appreciation Month. And I don't know who designated October as Pastor Appreciation Month. Uh, I'm thankful to them, but it's also a humbling and encouraging thing. So I wanted to say on behalf of our team, thank you 
for all of those expressions of love. Uh, a, a little update of a personal nature and a prayer request to go with it. Several of you have asked even this morning, hey, how, how is Kristen? She had a PET scan on Monday and uh, the initial results, we haven't had the official sit down consultation with the oncologist, but the initial report and summary shows about a 50% reduction in the cancer, no new lesions, and there are a couple of other things we're eager to talk with the oncologist about, but right now, everything in the report is very encouraging. So thank you for your prayers. Keep praying. Uh, if God has uh, carried her this far through six months, then we're eager to see what the next uh, period of time will hold. Um, so thank you, thank you for your prayers. She and I are flying out this afternoon, uh, a, a trip back east, a dual purpose. We're gonna help to lead a retreat for four pastors and their wives. This is something that God put on our hearts several years ago, and this is actually the fourth retreat that we're able to help host. Uh, the first three were here in Utah, but we're actually gonna do one back in South Carolina where we're from and it's with a team of, of pastors and their wives that we know pretty well and are very grateful for them and want to bless them. That retreat will be Tuesday through Thursday and then we're gonna uh, get back to the town where I grew up and we lived for many years. We have a niece getting married next Saturday and that's a joyous occasion. Uh, and then we'll return uh, a couple of days after that. So we won't see you, actually we won't see you for the next two Sundays. We'll be back in Utah uh, the no November 12th. Can you believe November's here? Um, no, November 12th is a Sunday that we won't be here um, because I'm pre, yeah. <laughs> we have so many dates and times in our head. Uh, November 12th, uh, I'll be up at Gospel Grace at their invitation. They, they try to bring uh, pastors from our, our family of churches to speak and give updates periodically. And so November 12th is, is the, day, uh, the, the date that they've invited me up. Um, so we'll be there and uh, not see you for, at least not here on a Sunday for several more weeks, and we always miss being here. I tell you this, and I mean it sincerely, there's no place in all the world I'd rather be on a Lord's Day worshiping than right here at Gospel Hope. Uh, so know that we will miss you. Thankful, um, you'll, you'll be in good hands as always. It's the beauty of a team of, of pastors, and Matt's gonna take the Ecclesiastes baton and run with it for a couple of Sundays. Uh, and I know you will be richly blessed by that. Last little word before we pray. I have been asked about this and even reminded this morning. Uh, and even if, if I can say it this way graciously, there might be some growing concern that we haven't publicly prayed for Israel yet. Um, and that's not because I personally it is not because I don't have great concern there. I, even going back to my childhood, I've always been one of the last ones in the pool, if you know what I mean. So even several weeks ago when the, the brutal attack took place and then retaliation and declaration of war began, um, I'm very much a wait and see kind of guy. And, and so I don't claim to have any prophetic insight. I do have great concern, I know you all do. What is clear to me from the scriptures uh, is that we should pray for the peace of Jerusalem. But that's more than just, uh, you know, uh, peace from the conflict of war. The, the peace of Jerusalem ultimately is the return of Christ when he establishes his eternal rule and reign. Before that happens, though, there's something critical that I would want us to focus our hearts on. Uh, the Lord has told us very clearly that nobody knows the time or day of his return, so we'd be foolish to speculate. I even think it's a little premature at this point to speculate if this is the beginning of you know, Armageddon. Um, but a couple of years ago when we studied through the Gospel of Mark and we came to chapter 13, we paid very careful attention to the clear commands that our Lord gave us because his own disciples were basically saying, when is all this gonna come to pass? And he never answered that question, if you remember. Now he gave some clues and he likened those clues to birth pangs. And, and when the labor pains start, and a baby's on the way, there's no stopping it. And one of the things that happens is that the, the contractions get closer and closer in proximity until you know, the, the final push. And I think what is really exciting for us, and this is some of what stirs our heart, it seems like the contractions are growing closer in their frequency right now. I mean, this is a, this is a moment in history where there's great chaos and turmoil. 
And yes, I do think we are closer to the end of the age. Uh, if nothing else, 24 hours closer to it than we were yesterday at this same time. But I have a great hope and expectation in my heart, and I want you to as well. But back to what Mark 13 says. Uh, if you look through those commands, Jesus says, stay awake, be alert, and he emphasizes being faithful in the daily task. And that leads me to the final point. I am certain that Jesus will not return until the gospel has been spread through all the world. And, and that's what we need to focus on. I, I'm fine. I admire some of you who you know, have the capacity to digest huge portions of Scripture and put things together. I listened to a fascinating presentation this week uh, and discussion between two really uh, dedicated Bible scholars and pulling some of the, old, I would call them Old Testament templates uh, into view and, and showing how some things that we're seeing right now might fit with some of those things. But even they were very careful not to say, you know, date and time and, you know, here's what will happen. We just don't know. I want us to, to, to pray and dedicate ourselves afresh to sharing the gospel. We have an opportunity right here in Utah. We support uh, some mission partners. The Carpenkos have been trying to get back to Israel for a couple of years now, and it just seems like it's been one delay after another. Uh, so you can pray for them. You can support them with the hope that they will be able to return to that land. Do you know right now the evangelical population in Israel is less than one half of 1%? Now we know why, because Romans 9, 10, and 11 tell us why. That for a season, God has, has actually turned away from this one nation that he chose above all other nations on the earth hardened them in their resistance and rebellion toward him in order that the gospel might go to Gentiles. And the vast majority of us here are Gentiles. And so we agonize for their salvation, but Paul even said as concerning uh, the gospel, they're actually enemies at, at that particular point. They were the ones who were fighting Paul and the apostles in the early church and persecuting them, and yet God has shown grace and mercy and there's gonna come a remarkable time, as Paul says in Romans, uh, a point in human history where all Israel will be saved. So that's all bundled into our prayers. It's so much more than just pray that they will stop killing each other, shooting at each other, and, and, and blowing up the country. There's a spiritual work in warfare that's under right now, underway right now, and the souls of precious people all around the world hang in the balance. That's what we need to pray for. And that's, that's part of what we mean when we say pray for the peace of Jerusalem. So we'll do that. Let's do that right now. And then we'll turn to Ecclesiastes 8. Father, thank you that you are king over all. Thank you that you have laid out purposes from before the foundation of this world. Purposes to save people from every tribe and tongue and household and nation. It seems at this moment that those who are truly redeemed, who have turned from their sins and put their faith in you, remain in the minority of earth's population. Oh, how can this be? How can it be when you said to Messiah long ago, ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance? How can it be, Lord God, that the, the believing population remains so small comparatively when the Lord has shed his blood, has risen from the tomb, has ascended on high, has sent his spirit into the world. In spirit of God, you have made your dwelling in us. Oh, Lord God, we beg you that you would fulfill every eternal purpose for the salvation of those that you have created in your image, that both Jew and Gentile alike would fall before you today Repenting of sin, believing the gospel, turning in full faith and assurance and knowing the powerful cleansing of the blood of Christ, the indwelling of the Spirit, the joy that comes from forgiveness, the peace that rises from union with Christ. Oh, we beg you for the peace of Jerusalem. We do pray that on this day you would guard and keep your people, and we pray that there would be a ceasing of hostility, 
There's so much anger in the hearts of humanity these days and division everywhere we look and we know that the only solution for this is that our Savior, who is the Prince of Peace, would make his appearance. Jesus, hear our cries. We long to see you. We long to see you in your glory. We long to see you ascend your throne. We long to see the nations brought under your rod of iron knowing that all that you command and decree comes to pass and every decree is good and wise and holy. Thank you for that work of grace that you have done in so many here. And yet we pray that on this day for those who have not yet surrendered their hearts fully to you, that this would be the day that you would lead them firmly, gently, but decisively on this day to the King of Kings. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Well, open your Bibles to Ecclesiastes 8, please. And if you're using one of the Bibles provided for you there in the seat rack in front of you, you'll find this on page 557. 557, I'm gonna read the entire chapter and then we're gonna make our way through this chapter in the time we have remaining. Ecclesiastes 8. The preacher, as he refers to himself, writes these words. Who is like the wise, and who knows the interpretation of a thing? A man's wisdom makes his face shine, and the hardness of his face is changed. I say, keep the king's command because of God's oath to him. Be not hasty to go from his presence. Do not take your stand in an evil cause, for he does whatever he pleases. For the word of the king is supreme. And who may say to him, what are you doing? Whoever keeps the command will know no evil thing, and the wise heart will know the proper time and the just way. For there is a time and a way for everything, although man's trouble lies heavy on him. For he does not know what is to be, for who can tell him how it will be? No man has power to retain the spirit or power over the day of his death. There is no discharge from war, nor will wickedness deliver those who are given to it. All this I observed while applying my heart to all that is done under the sun when man had power over man to his hurt. Then I saw the wicked buried. They used to go in and out of the holy place and were praised in the city where they had done such things. This also is vanity. Because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed speedily, the heart of the children of man is fully set to do evil. Though a sinner does evil a hundred times and prolongs his life, yet I know that it will be well with those who fear God because they fear before him. But it will not be well with the wicked, neither will he prolong his days like a shadow because he does not fear before God. There is a vanity that takes place on earth that there are righteous people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the wicked and there are wicked people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the righteous. I said that this also is vanity and I commend joy For man has nothing better under the sun but to eat and drink and be joyful. For this will go with him in his toil through the days of his life that God has given him under the sun. When I applied my heart to know wisdom and to see the business that is done on earth, how neither day nor night do one's eyes see sleep, then I saw all the work of God that man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun. However much man may toil in seeking, he will not find it out. Even though a wise man claims to know, he cannot find it out. This is God's word. Well, we're going to return to that little bit of a a paradigm we established uh, based on what Solomon writes at the end of this book, that his his words are like nails and goads. The goads are prods. They're designed to to poke us and make us uncomfortable and get us moving a certain direction. The nails of God's wisdom in this book uh, are, are like the useful nails that you would use to frame something up. And we see that behind us uh, week in and week out as this construction project continues to come together. And, and aren't we thankful that there are uh, good supplies of nails and screws and all of those things that'll hold the building together. Well, God's wisdom functions like nails that hold your soul together. 
And so I wanna look at some wisdom nails, we'll call them from verses one through seven, make a few brief observations here and then keep moving through the passage. So hold with me here. Notice first of all in verse one, wisdom is valuable to the individual. Who is like the wise? And who knows the interpretation of a thing, Solomon asks. Well, in the word interpretation, as it appears throughout the Old Testament, is attached to some really important characters, like Joseph and Daniel, who each stood before non-believing kings and had interpretation of key dreams that God had sent to these particular rulers. So interpretation is not like the interpretation of a foreign language where if you just studied enough and went through enough classes, you would know how to interpret the foreign language. No, this is is interpretation and understanding of divine things. And so Solomon's question, who is like the wise? Well, the answer is they're not common. They're actually somewhat uncommon. And Solomon, or the preacher as he refers to himself through this book, is pointing to, humanly speaking, the impossible challenge facing the wise men and sages and counselors in a king's court. But he's using this to prompt us to ask the question, who is like the wise? And am I like the wise? Notice the next line. A man's wisdom makes his face shine. There's there's joy, and we're going to come back to that at the end of this chapter. And then he says, the hardness of his face is changed. Now, in the Old Testament, there are passages like Deuteronomy 28, verse 50, that use the same term for hardness uh, in, in a person's face, and it's caused by sin. And so where wisdom, as one author writes, shines into a heart with clear and cheery light, there the harsh effects of sin disappear, and the evidence of the change is apparent externally as well. We ought to pause and ask a question. I mean, do I have a sour countenance? Or do I have a bright countenance? A sour countenance can sometimes be an indicator that a person is not full of God's wisdom. There are other reasons for a sour countenance, but you know, if you're characterized by a frowny face all the time, you might want to ask, well, what am I putting into my soul that emerges through my face in that way? Does your countenance shine with God's wisdom? Are you seeking the Lord's wisdom daily? In his word. We've talked about that before, but you know, if you just took the book of Proverbs and you began to read a few Proverbs a day, those are specific words of wisdom, you might be amazed at the transformation that would take place in your heart. That would be one way to seek wisdom. Now look at verses two through five. Wisdom is helpful for life under imperfect authority. Oh, and this is so good. This makes me so hopeful. Here the preacher is writing in the context of a monarchy, which is very different from a democratic republic that, at least at this moment, uh, we're still living under here in the United States. In theory, we self-govern by electing representatives to go to City Hall, the state capitol, to Washington, D.C. to govern on our behalf. But I think the vast majority of us feel at least a little sense of disappointment. Uh, and, and we might you know, love our representatives and say, well, these are good people. We're thankful for them. But what's going on with the rest of the country, right? Well, the following principles are universal for those who live under imperfect authority, whether it's a monarchy where the king just does what he wants, as Solomon is going to note here, or in a case like ours, we have imperfect elected officials, many of whom are corrupt through and through. How do we function under imperfect authority? Here here are some very general principles. First of all, uh, look at verse 2. Reverent obedience, I think, is in focus here. Keep the king's command because of God's oath to him, or some of your English translations say, because of your oath to him. That's just a little, a little sidebar here. Hebrew can be really challenging to translate. And so that's why some English uh, versions go one way and one goes the other. But here is the general principle. It, it reminds us, doesn't it? There's an echo of, or maybe I should say, Paul has an echo of, of, of what Solomon wrote 950 years before that, Romans 13, 1, where Paul says, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. That's the general principle. It doesn't mean that you blindly obey. No relationship on planet Earth carries that kind of, of unquestioning authority. Not the government, 
not a spouse, not a parent, not an employer. As a matter of fact, we know this to be true from places like Acts 5.29, where when the apostles were instructed and even warned by the officials in Jerusalem that they should cease preaching, they turned around and said simply, we must obey God rather than men. Sorry, we're going to disobey you. You could cast it in those terms, but actually it's an act of obedience to the commands of God. Well, you have something similar here. There's a a principle of reverent obedience. Second of all, verse three, patient service. Be not hasty to go from his presence. He doesn't tell us why you might be hasty to go from his presence. Maybe you're just kind of generally, you know, ticked off with the king or you disagree with one of his decrees. You say to yourself, I can't stand in this court any longer and be a part of the evil that's underway. And you know, we feel similar things, but I would say, we, like Solomon is teaching us, should not be hasty to move out of those places where we actually have a voice, small as it might be. There might be personal influence. We ought to be people who vote in our, uh, in our governmental system. We ought to vote with an informed Christian conscience. And yes, sometimes we are choosing the lesser of two evils. I remember a, a pious man a number of years ago saying, well, you know, as a follower of Jesus, you should never choose evil. I'm like, be reasonable, you know, and he was trying to make a case uh, for his particular viewpoint. You vote your conscience before the Lord, use your influence, small as it might be, to serve your community, to serve your country. Don't, don't be hasty. I hope none of you would say, you know, depending on how this election goes, I'm gonna move to, and you know, you pick that little beautiful island in the South Pacific somewhere. No, you should hang around until it's impossible. Number three, righteous submission. Do not take your stand in an evil cause for what he does, the king is in view here, for he does whatever he pleases for the word of the king is supreme and who may say to him, what are you doing? So you can lose your influence, you can also waste your influence, but righteousness remains our priority. And there may be a moment where you say, "I, I can't stand with you in this. Can't be a part of it. Number four, confident expectation. Look at verse five. Whoever keeps a command will know no evil thing and the wise heart will know the proper time and the just way. The the Lord casts some of this in perspective. Again, I think he's speaking through Solomon in very general terms that if, if you are a law keeper in society, you should expect good things to come. Doesn't always work that way. We're gonna get to some of those uh, contradictions and tensions here in just a moment, but confident expectation. God does bless his people when they live righteously. Let's move on very quickly. Third, wisdom nail, verses six through eight. Wisdom is realistic in this imperfect world. Solomon picks up that idea he had just laid out in verse five about the proper time and the just way. And now he says, for there is a time and a way for everything, although man's trouble lies heavy on him. And you say, that sounds familiar. Yep, chapter three, it was weeks ago. I I don't even remember all of my sermon from that day, so I don't expect you to remember it either. But remember in chapter three, Ecclesiastes tells us that God makes all things beautiful in his time. And I think there's an echo of this here as well. But notice we're seeking to exercise wisdom while we remain troubled. Man's trouble lies heavy on him. And you know, beloved, it's okay to actively trust in God, seek to serve him, be obedient to his word, and at the same time, sigh and groan and cry. Now, there's a difference between groaning and just complaining, but how could you not look at the world right now and go, oh, when is this going to end? How can we continue down this path of, of, of destruction that our culture just seems to be intent on pursuing? Trouble lies heavy on us, but we're hopeful too. We know that there really is a time and a way for everything because the God we worship and serve appoints and governs the seasons of history. And if you go back to chapter three and read through it again, all those beautiful examples of the extremes of human life, even from birth to death death itself, God is the one who actually makes all things beautiful in its time. So no, our life is not always gonna be this hard. 
No, there's not always going to be this kind of corruption from the highest office in our land down to you know, the, the neighborhood bully. Look at verse seven. He does not know what is to be, for who can tell him how it will be? Part of the reason the trouble of this moment lies so heavy on us is that we don't know what will happen next. This, variations of this have been floating around, but do you feel like you wake up each morning and kind of p- poke your head around the corner of the door and look outside? Some of you may say, what chapter of Revelation? That's the last book of the Bible. It's apocalyptic literature. It's a prophecy that God unfolded through the Apostle John about the end of the first century, and it, and it actually describes in a fair amount of detail the end of the world, and it's scary stuff. Some of us feel like we're living, you know, like this every day, and we kind of are. So part of the reason the trouble of this moment lies so heavy on us is we don't know the future, and then look at the examples that that, uh, the preacher gives us in verse eight. Four examples of limits. No man has power to retain the spirit, or power over the day of his death. There's no discharge or release from war. It's like when the king declares war, guess who's going to war? The king's soldiers. And then number four, nor will wickedness deliver those who are given to it. Oh, there's a little ray of hope there. The bad guys aren't always gonna get their way. They're not always gonna be the ones who seem to win whatever uh, they pursue. Another commentator writes, the injustice and sorrows of life force us to come to terms with the powers that govern us. On the human level, this is the king, but on the higher level, this is God. You know what would be a great tragedy? For you to live out your days frustrated by the fact that there's imperfect leadership all around you and all over you, and yet never come to terms with the fact that the great king of the universe is the ultimate one that you must come to terms with. Are you living your life as if there is no God in the universe? Are you living your life as if there is no king who is sovereign over your creation, the span of your life, and your eternal destination? What a tragic loss and even waste to live out your days, yeah, frustrated by earthly imperfect leadership, and yet never come to terms with the God who created you. Let's go to the second big point. Grouping some things together here in verses nine through 14, we're gonna return to the fear of God. The preacher writes, all this I observed while applying my heart to all that is done under the sun when man had power over man to his hurt. And he's been at this place before, but this is the first of several examples of of the frustrations and even the indignation that the preacher feels as he looks at the world and so big or or if you're trying to you know make a real outline we might say letter a under big point number two the fear of God includes a realistic expression of personal frustration and indignation verse 9 is the first example of that we feel frustration over mankind hurting mankind look at verse 10 there's indignation over the honorable burials for the wicked You know, we have some politicians now who are at the end of their lifespans, and it's just on record, you know, the the corruption and, frankly, the exploitation that uh, they are guilty of, even through legislation, some at the state level, some at the national level. I'll guarantee you, at their funerals, people will say nothing but nice things about them. And those who have suffered under the rule of that kind of leadership will grind their teeth silently or just turn off the TV. It's right to be indignant when wicked people are honored. Look at verse 11. What a great frustration is delayed justice. Because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed speedily, the heart of the children of man is fully set to do evil. Boy, isn't that true? Do you know there's a reason God instituted capital punishment? Not every sin or offense is worthy of the death penalty, but some are, and he did it. As he said way back, in, it's recorded in Genesis, whoever sheds man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God 
I created humanity. And part of the reason there's so little regard for life in our day and age is because we didn't bring the hammer down early and often. You say, well, that, that sounds kind of harsh. No, it, it actually is in deference to the innocent people such as those in the state of Maine who lost their lives. And I know a lot will be said about gun control, which is not the problem, mental illness, which is getting closer to the heart of the issue, but it's actually a heart issue. I'm all for getting people help who are truly mentally ill, Ill, but beloved, it's not just a chemical imbalance in, in some poor guy's head. Hearts of humanity are set to do evil. And, and when people who are filled with evil thoughts and ambitions see that, hey, there's no recourse, I can do what I want, well, do you know the old saying, saying Katie, bar the door? I have no, who, no idea who Katie is, but apparently somebody needed her to bar the door to keep bad things from coming in. Katie, bar the door. The fear of God includes a realistic expression of these personal frustrations. Look at verse 12. There's a sinner who prolongs his life. There are righteous people, verse 14, who experience bad, and there are wicked people who experience good. We say, Lord, what gives? And then we say, oh, that's right. Lord, you are king, and nobody's getting away with anything. So the fear of the Lord actually includes a realistic expression of all these personal frustrations and indignation, but the fear of God also creates, secondly, a positive faith. Look at the end of verse 12. Yet I know that it will be well with those who fear God because they fear before him. Don't you want to say, Solomon, how do you know that? Because life experience at the moment doesn't seem to guarantee that for any of us. Well, we know that because that's what God promises, and then he backs it up with historical records. Just just read through the stories that have been accumulated and included in the Old and the New Testaments. You can't find one story of a person who faithfully followed God, who in the end said, that's a bad deal. God's not faithful to his promises. God doesn't restore us. God doesn't bring peace. God doesn't bring ultimate healing. God doesn't do the thing that he promised he would do. We're not hoping in vain. We're hoping because there are real promises. Now here's what we lose sight of. All of us actually are in a position of picking your fear. There's nobody who lives fearlessly. I mean, maybe in some small way, but I mean, there's nobody who's immune from worry, anxiety, uh, the, the doubts and the turmoil of soul and heart, and all that comes under the umbrella of fear. Now, that's what uh, Solomon stated, the, the portion in, in italics there. He says, I know it will be well for those who fear God. But if you choose not to fear God, and you choose, thing, you choose to fear things like economic frustrations and political scandal, or you live in fear of climate change and world war, or you live in fear of having enough affirmation and approval of others, or you li- live in the fear of just losing control of your world, you're still living in fear. But those kinds of fears drive us to insanity. The fear of God actually is expulsive of all those kinds of fear. But go back to the text and look at verse 15 with me. And I want you to see a connection here because these are not random proverbs or sayings that are thrown together. I really do believe there is intention and purpose in how Uh, Solomon structures these things. So coming out of those expressions of frustration and even indignation over the hard things that he sees, notice where he goes. So I commend joy. But don't, don't unhitch that from the fear of God because it makes no sense He's actually saying, I, I commend joy. I commend a sensory Joy, I commend you to to find those things that, and remember from earlier chapters, these are gifts that come from God. 
But these are simple sensory pleasures. Look at what he says. Man has nothing better under the sun but to eat and drink and be joyful. Yeah, but the planet's on fire. In one sense, yes, but who's king? Yeah, but I'm so fearful that I, I, I've even lost my appetite. Then you should inhale the rarefied air of God's truth and listen to his perspective on all of this rather than whatever feeds that fear. And aren't you thankful? Again, here's the realistic view of our world and our life just bleeding through. Look at the next part of this verse. For this will go with him, eating, drinking, and joy, specifically, in his toil. And remember, that's a word that refers to exhausting labor. You say, how can I be joyful and exhausted at the same time? Well, because you live in the fear of God. And that's what gives you your perspective. And living in the fear of God and having his perspective on this life, you're, you're continually reminded that the best days are yet to come for God's followers. What a remarkable thing that people should enjoy the good things that God gives to them in this life even while the world seems to be burning down. Now, lest we think that that somehow detaches us from it, uh, look at, look at well, I fell behind here, uh, look at verses 16 and 17 and notice how the fear of the Lord does give us perspective. And these verses remind us that there are just certain things you cannot find out and that little phrase is repeated three times. You can't know. God, but I want to know the eternal purpose, and I want to see the expansive plan that you have in place, and I want to know how this little piece of my life fits in the big scheme of things, and God's saying, not, not now. You won't. You can try, but you cannot find it out. And, and that, if, if I can put it this way, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll say it a little more politely than what I was going to say. That lack of understanding, I was just going to use the word ignorance, that lack of understanding actually has the effect of driving you back to the God who does govern all and know all and see all. It drives you back to him and it, put, it positions you to rest even in your limits. That's an uncomfortable place for some of us because I, I, I really want to know everything. I want to control everything. I want to possess as much of, I know I won't possess everything on planet Earth, but I, I, you know, I want a big share because that makes me feel comfortable. It makes me feel secure. It makes me feel safe. And God's saying, I'm not calling you to be comfortable and safe and secure in yourself. I'm your comfort and security. It's curious that so many of us believe and even live like we know more than God knows. Well, God, I just think it would be a better plan if Hamas had not attacked Israel. Maybe. I, I don't disagree with you at this moment, but can, God has an amazing track record of even taking evil and turning it for good. And we looked just a few weeks ago, and I want to remind you again that the ultimate evil committed in the history of the world is that the blameless Son of God was put to death as if he were guilty of unthinkable, unimaginable crimes, but we know he was innocent. What was he guilty of? Healing the sick, raising the dead, feeding the hungry, preaching the good news of peace to those who were wrecked and ruined by their sins. Oh, he's guilty of being the king of kings. But God turned that ultimate evil into the ultimate good because through his death and resurrection, real sinners who deserve condemnation and death and all things horrific receive life. This has a, a sweet effect too of just lowering the tension that we feel so often like we gotta solve the world's problems. 12 million children in the United States of America who are underfed, hungry every day. That, that's a gripping thing. But you know what, I, God is not asking me or you to feed all 12 million. And when I remember that he's king over all, I begin to say, Lord, you're aware of that. I know your heart must grieve if my imperfect heart is grieved by that. I may not be able to 
feed all 12 million, but what can I do? And that's where he prompts me to say, well, you know, you can open your table generously to family, friends, neighbors. You can also donate to your local food bank. And then you begin to think creatively, like instead of like, I gotta solve the world's problems. No, God will in time. I can participate with him in a little small, unknown way. Are the oceans gonna rise? Mm, No, actually there's specific scripture that God said when he created it, he said to the oceans, you can go this far on the shore and no further, period. Take a breath. As bad as it is, you can breathe. Because this king is over all. Well, we need to conclude. A few little simple but I hope profound truths. Are you willing to accept this? We are not kings. We are not kings of our personal fates. And number two, we do not control the world as we so desperately want to. Leave that to the climate czars. Keeps them happy. We actually have more important work to do. And number three, it does remind us we need the king. And you know, we have him. He came once and he's coming again. He came the first time to bring life and forgiveness and salvation and redemption and reconciliation. He's coming the second time to plant his sovereign and magisterial feet on his ground and assume his throne. And those who know him, who've repented of their sins and put their faith in him will be welcomed into his kingdom and those who have rebelled and rejected him will be cast out Condemned and punished forever. That's heavy, isn't it? But some of us live our lives as if we might actually be able to take God down. You know, there's a, when I was in college, um, I was introduced to some uh, great literature. It's American literature. And in 1927, author James Weldon Johnson published a book of poems titled God's Trombones. And there's a famous portion that has morphed into a variety of renditions, but the original line of one of those poems that is titled The Prodigal Son just echoes in my mind, not only because I read it, because I remember uh, a man I admired greatly who actually recited that poem as part of a a larger presentation. And that when I, even when I read this to you, I, I cannot escape the echo of that man's booming and beautiful voice. But the line that I think I will never forget and I wanna share with you here in conclusion is this, young man, young man, your arms too short to box with God. Are you boxing with God today? It's a fool's errand. So bow. Bow to this forever king. Bow to this God who gave his life that you might be delivered from sin. Let's pray together. Father, there is much in the world that concerns us, but we come to this place again of saying that you are king forever. Would you give us grace to believe your word and to act upon it? As your heads are bowed in a spirit of prayer for just a moment, I I want to interrupt that prayer and let you know that right after the service, there's an opportunity for you to come to the front over here uh, to my left, your right, and Dean and Wendy Masinskis are gonna be available to pray with you. I'm not gonna be able to remain today because we actually have to depart, um, head to the airport, as I mentioned earlier. I regret that. But if there's something that God is doing in your heart right now where you're saying, I I need to know more about this king, I I need to understand what it means to repent of my sins, Dean and Wendy 
are specifically available for you today, but again, you're among friends. There are others here who would love to open the Bible and just show you how you can know that your sins are forgiven, how you can know that you have the gift of eternal life through Christ, how you can know that you are rightly related to this forever king. So would you take advantage of this invitation? And would you seek the help, the encouragement, the prayer of someone like Dean and Wendy? Father, how we thank you for your mercy to us and pray that you would give us grace. Um, You have given us great grace in Jesus. Let your word find its place in our hearts and take root and bear the beautiful fruit of life. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You want to do one verse? Only do one verse. We're just going to sing one verse. So you stand. We'll conclude that. Take a short break and then uh, resume for our family meeting here in just a few minutes. Andrew. Rejoice, the Lord is King, your Lord and King of I don't want to rush your fellowship time too much. And the first thing we're doing family meeting is welcome some new members. So you want to be here for that. So let's go 15 minutes. We'll start our family update at 1135 sharp. Thanks for worshiping with us today.